but I have now pressed record. So we are here on the feed of Comics in Motion doing something we actually did uh, this time last year, a little bit earlier actually in the year, um, but it was about Mandalorian Series 2. We got a group of people together who are Star Wars fans to go through it week by week and talk about well what we found really. And so we thought it'd be a good idea to do it this year and extend out so we've got more members of the family coming in. And so I'm going to introduce them for you. So first of all is the one that you guys should all know if you're listening to Comics in Motion, which is uh, we call him the podfather, him and uh, Chris, but it is Dave Horrocks. So Dave, introduce yourself and uh, yeah, uh, just introduce yourself. <laughs> hey there, Mike. So it's great to speak to you again. Obviously coming back, geeking out a little bit on Star Wars. And of course, I mean, this Star Wars was kind of how you and I first properly connected, wasn't it? I think mm. it was, I think we were chatting about, was it Dread? And you yeah, just we did. happened to mention yeah. that you were this massive Star Wars fan. And I thought I was like ninja level. And then you just proved I'm not. <laughs> I'm not I'm more of a Padawan. So um no, it's great to be back and, and speaking about this one. And of course, you know, we we spoke about Mandalorian last year and what a finale. You know, mm-hmm. so I, I think coming into this, I was kind of like, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to it. But if it had come out nine months earlier, if it had come out last March or something, I'd have been so pumped for it. Mm. But um so so looking forward to it without being super excited, I would say. Nice, nice. Okay, and then Dan or Spider Dan, as you are well known throughout the interwebs, when you introduce yourself and uh tell us how kind of hyped were you for uh well uh Book of Boba Fett. The Book of Boba Fett. Uh, well, I heard it was a bit of a page turner. Uh, so I'm Spider Dan, if you don't know me, of Spider Dan and the Secret Balls podcast. Um, I have always been a bit of a Star Wars nerd. Um, early on when I was a child, I was a bit more in, into it. I got into the whole legend stuff, the comics and everything. Um, so as I've gotten older, I've, I've stu- I kind of got into wrestling for a bit. For, I had a, a, teen- a teenage period when I got into wrestling, and then I kind of fell back in love with Marvel and stuff. And obviously that's just carried me off in a way. Uh, but I I have, in the last two days, in preparation for this podcast, like, you know, I don't do this for everybody, Mike. I think it's just <laughs> for you. I binged both seasons of Mandalorian and watched the book of Boba Fett. And I bloody loved it. Obviously, late to the party, but I bloody loved The Mandalorian. It was great. It was everything that I hoped it would be. Uh, So coming right after the season (laughs) finale of uh, Mandalorian, I was looking forward to this because I thought it's going to be the Boba Fett show that everybody wanted, but it's it has a little bit of a different spin than what you would expect because obviously the Mandalorian is in line with, with that character very much. But yeah, I was very hyped. Mm, awesome and then andy or as angry andy as you have shown the internet for yourself to be uh please introduce yourself and tell um tell everyone sort of how hyped were you for book of boba fett thanks mike yeah uh angry andy here of angry andy reviews over on youtube um very small channel but um i am a mega star wars geek uh obviously no surprise looking at my screen um (laughs) i've been a star wars fan since i was six seven eight years old and it's literally carried through right the way through for me um and practically is everything i do on a daily basis as well not a day goes by when there's not some reference or quotation or something i do that is connected to star wars <laughs> probably a bit too much for the missus sometimes but you know <laughs> you have to live with it um but yeah i was i've i've been a mega boba fett fan since the beginning i think i was always surprised and curious about him you know every time something came up something new and obviously him popping up in the mandalorian was a revelation and similar to dave i was i think i would have been more hyped weirdly enough it came out pretty much straight away but because you've been slowly edging towards it with minimalistic trailers i've been sort of like okay let's keep them let's keep that excitement a bit tempered Let's see what happens. I think I'm more like that. I'm I'm waiting to see what happens. But yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to seeing where it goes. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, I was quite hyped for uh, Book of Boba Fett. Um, I think I was kind of in a similar camp to you guys where if it had come after Mando, I'd have had like, you know, Star Wars fever. But also I'm quite glad because we haven't really had any, like this year, we basically had Bad Batch, which is great. Um, But obviously Mm -hmm. it was animated and... 16 episodes i think and then we had visions which was 
fun in parts, but was obviously inconsistent because anthology. Yeah, yeah. And so with that, the whole year we've not we've been kind of Star Wars starved in a way because of so because we've basically been um we've had way too much not in a bad way but you know we've been spoiled with star wars content since uh the force awakens with kind of a movie relatively every year and then loads of other additional content coming with that as well and then the, obviously the coming years we've got even more stuff and our book of boba fett i was excited for it more so because it's star wars less so because it's about boba fett um obviously i'm a bit younger than you, you fellas <laughs> sorry oh he um, loves to twist the knife but, in there i know <laughs> sorry about that i'm not uh, sure about andy you, you and andy must be about the same wasn't you uh, if Andy's uh, happy to reveal uh, his age on there, but <laughs> yeah, I'm, an, I'm an 80s kid. I'm an 80s kid. Yeah, Pete, whereas I'm, I'm, not... I'm an 80s kid too. So yeah, I guess. Yeah, and I'm a 90s. You know, I'm a this young just... this young up start. Put that little yeah. tiny blade right in between. Them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't come. I didn't bring you guys together just to mock you. Would be like, ha I'm living longer. But it was actually because <laughs> I know Boba Fett with. Uh, more so people grew up with the original trilogy more so than the prequels because i grew up with the prequels for me boba fett wasn't the coolest character because i think in the prequels and stuff there's so many yeah but much bigger pool to delve into and things Mm. and so for me although i thought yeah boba fett was cool i i thought jango fett was cooler because he gets more time to do cool stuff because although he gets killed by mace and obviously um attack of the clones he kind of he does do quite a few things and he fights against obi-wan etc etc but you know, I was interested by the show. I was just like, any more live action Star Wars? Just put it straight into my veins. You know, uh, Kenobi's the thing I think I'm most excited for. But um, yeah. yeah, so with this then going in, so our sort of, it was released, you know, 29th of January and stuff. And then I've got a fun little fact here, which was um, Boba Fett was born 32 years before the Battle of Yavin, which is when the Phantom Menace was, basically. Um, so fun little bit about that. So with the book of Boba Fett, did you guys... Regarding your expectations of what you wanted from the show, in a sense, obviously we've seen the first episode as of recording this. What exactly did you want for the show, I'd say, is the question. And then in your opinion, do, do you feel like the first episode has delivered on what you kind of wanted? So we'll flip it round. We'll start with Andy first, if that's all right. So what kind of, what stuff did you expect? And what do you think it's kind of, what of what you expected has the first episode delivered on? Well, I expected something that would feel different mm. to to the to Mandalorian. Um I think obviously the first episode is a bit difficult. It's an interesting episode. Um it plays a lot into the flashbacks and doesn't take you very far forward in terms of the narrative it's going to take. Mm. It's very much in in the there and in the there and now, which isn't a bad thing. Um but I'm what I what I'm sort of expecting is for it to take a very different route to what we've seen from Star Wars before. I really want it to tap into this criminal underworld, this this gangsters and you know mobsters kind of thing. I'm expecting almost like you know like a Goodfellas, mm. Sopranos kind of series set in the Star Wars universe, and I'm hoping it delivers in that in that in that way. And with this first episode, it doesn't really you get a small sense of it. I think my favorite scene in this in this first episode, this the the scene that probably hints that it's going that way was the throne room with people coming in paying tribute mm-hmm. and then the little bits of people giving him grief you know under their breath i was like yes this is what i want to see i want to see this this tony soprano figure as in boba fett form you know struggling to maintain all these other groups that don't like the fact that he's taken power mm-hmm. I, I want to see that and that's where i'm hoping it goes with it but mm-hmm. having said that the flashbacks i think a necessary thing that we needed to see, obviously, given what we do see. Um, I really enjoyed it. Kind of wanted a bit more mm. from the um, from the old escape from the the, the Sarlacc thing. If we're gonna, well, we're gonna go with spoilers anyway, aren't we? Because we know yeah. it's gonna happen. Yeah, we knew it was gonna happen. <laughs> they were gonna show That's it true. every single moment of it, weren't they? I wanted a bit more. Mm. Weirdly enough, I wanted a bit more because it plays into the three stages of absolute misery that he goes through. So he gets out of the pit, he gets robbed, and then he gets captured by sand people. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. But I wanted to see just that little bit more of pain and suffering that we heard so much about the Salak pit. <laughs> Nobody gets out alive. He's the only person that we ever hear about or see getting out, as far as I'm aware. There probably there might be more. But just a little bit more of that, I think, would have played into you know building that character that we're going to see that we haven't really seen of anything before. Mm. But... In in general, I think it was a good episode. It was an interesting episode, and it gives you plenty of hints about where it's going to go. 
but you know there's a few little things that I'm a little bit unsure about Hmm. and then uh, Dan what about your sort of thoughts on same thing um very much along the same lines as Andy uh, this kind of Michael Corleone kind of Jabba did it his way and did it this way and was cruel and was evil but no I'm gonna do it different I know how to be a crime lord with respect and honor and this kind of warrior's code and obviously this is putting him almost directly at odds with Fennec who's like no 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 you want fear not respect and I think further down the line that will there'll be a whole huge crack between the two and they'll separate maybe they'll fight or at least be at odds or maybe in a separate group or maybe she'll try and take his throne perhaps um, I mean, I, I know they've been calling it Jabba's throne, but Jabba can't fit on that thing. There's no way. There's no way Jabba sat. Yeah, but on that a crash diet, or it been, or it was modified at some point. <laughs> Absolutely, that's a that's a bid Fortuna throne. I don't think it's a Jabba throne, but I do like the rancors. But yeah, kind of similar to what I what Andy said. Kind of just the kind of the underworld, and um, I know a lot. Everybody was saying that we want to see you know something new and something different. So. Moss Eisley is, you know, I, I, obviously with the teaser on at the end of Mandalorian season two with him taking over, you're like, it is going to be Moss, Moss, not Moss Eisley, but, you know, Tatooine specifically. And we're going to see that kind of world. It is a very familiar world and we've seen it a dozen times before, but it is classic Star Wars and it is it is very lived in, you know. Um, it was even in the holiday special podcast that we, me and Andy did, you know, <laughs> very briefly, which is Boba Fett's first appearance as well. Yeah. Apart Got- from the parade he did. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, that's very much, very similar to Andy. I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, this kind of like, you know, he's going to try and get out, but he's going to pull him back in very much <laughs> like a Michael Corleone type thing. But, yeah, pretty much what Andy said. Nice. And then Dave? I tried desperately not to have any expectations. I kept reminding myself that actually Mandalorian, a lot of the time, although it was enjoyable, it wasn't explosive every single episode. It was very episodic. So you got a story, a self-contained story within the week. And then it was almost like a game. He, He did something at the end, which allowed him to progress or travel to the next place. And, So I never thought it was going to start in this boombastic way and we would have our minds blown like we did at the end of Mandalorian. So I was trying to just keep those expectations down. And after watching it, I've got this weird sense of, I think I got more than what I expected in some ways and not as much of what I expected in other ways. And I'm not even sure I can articulate that, but through the conversation, I'm hoping (laughs) I I can formulate my thoughts on it properly. But um, it was just, it was just great to be back in the world, wasn't it? Just, and and everything you could see with all the behind the scenes stuff with Mandalorian before that, you know, the guys running it, Favreau, Filoni's there, you know, they are so massive fanboys, aren't they? And all the little things behind, by God, how many cameos you even get like, you probably know the name of him, but the fat elephant, I'm trying, I want to know his story. How did he get off? How did he get off Jabba's floating palace thing? Because he was on that, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> I, I How did he survive? I want to see the scene where they all escape. They just get they go, right, this party's going downhill, boys. Let's yeah. get <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe his little drum kit. <laughs> or, or, no, it's more of a piano thing, isn't it? Yeah. Maybe that like floats up and, An and goes seat. away or something. Yeah. Yeah, so, I did make a note of Max Bebo, funnily enough. <laughs> I mean, I would say with me... Um, I, I enjoyed this. I as kind of with Dave, I was trying not to go in with too many expectations. I was hoping that they did reveal the Sarlacc thing quickly. Um I didn't yeah. want I feel like once again there could be more. I I'm not as familiar with Legends as I am with Canon, but I know that in Legends it was quite a long it was a, it was a story in a collection, but it was like he is stuck in the Sarlacc, he communicates with the consciousness of someone who's been slowly part digested by the Sarlacc, has been in there for ages, and then they yeah. work together to kind of get free and stuff, and it's very overly convoluted in my opinion, and it just mm. it, it for this story, I'm quite glad they didn't necessarily go down that route because I think it would have just almost wasted time in a sense. And I think yeah. that they're trying to do what the Mandalorian tried to do in a lot of ways, which was one of the things I liked is in Mando is that the episode lengths are different. I know some people didn't like that as much, but you know, with if I use Game of Thrones as an example, which I do really enjoy, my other last series, there are certain seasons where you've got like three or four episodes next to each other and you're like, these are, don't all need to be an hour long. There's only... 35 minutes worth of content here and i think what i like about mandalorian and what 
hopefully the live action series are going to do as well is they're going to release episodes as long as they need to be rather than how long they could be um, but with that i do actually feel like probably for the first time we could have actually done with maybe five minutes more um, either of him struggle with the sarlacc or with the tuscan raiders or something like that but i don't know if that was just me wanting more because we only got just over half an hour and i'm just like i want hours you know bad batch was a you know an hour ish long the first mandalorian um episode was 40 ish minutes long i think and so it's like i just wanted more but not in a bad way i was just kind of i want to be greedy with it that's where the benefit of binging comes in so yep (laughs) i got to do all of that all in one go one glorious journey um so there there is some benefits to so who do you manage to avoid it last year then so up until this point had, had you watched it at all no, I had not watched any. Oh wow! Um, I what have a had, treat! Uh, yeah. It was a treat. There was. I, I'll be honest. A, a lot of the all I saw initially was just Baby Yoda everything, and it kind of put me off. Mm. It was like it's only about Baby Yoda. It's all about Baby Yoda. Isn't he cute? Isn't he this? Look at the memes. Look at all this, and it really put me off. I'm like, I'm not interested. And then a, a few like little things were coming through, links to like the Clone Wars series and stuff like that, and then obviously the surprise cameo at the end of of mandalorian season two which was unavoidable an unavoidable spoiler anyway Mm, yeah um but all the story a lot of the story the main plot of it i didn't know i didn't know anything i knew a few of the characters names and stuff um you know but honestly it was just it was just an absolute blast just going through that and you know and i love baby yoda like everyone else now so i'm (laughs) I'm a changed man (laughs) <laughs> um, I've, I've come you, you, from the you were dark quite side. resistant to it for a, for a while weren't you even yeah. like through all our discussions you, you were very resistant to it and i was like yeah you, oh, damn Just, you why aren't you watching you, it all this crap you make me watch <laughs> and talk about with you and you won't watch this that's, that's my thing i do like cult movies and cult things things that aren't popular i try and force some people but uh but no i absolutely loved this enjoyed it and and I, I like the characters and the world that it's built and some of the things it's doing. I like some of the in-jokes as well, like when the stormtroopers can't shoot a target five feet in front of them <laughs> or they're making comments about that, things like that. I, I love it. And I think it's it's fun, it's creative. And again, it's introduced a whole new generation to Star Wars in a good, positive way. And it's not like necessarily a punching bag as it's been for many years. And, you know, depending on what films you've seen and where, um, it's absolutely, it's, it's mind-blowing how simple simple uh, an idea it is like it's like lone wolf and cub it's mm. you know, it's it's the gunslinger you know there's classic samurai and westerns yeah. smashed together with this sci-fi fantasy and and again like you said the stories don't necessarily need to be a set number of you know t- time you know if 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 a story needs to take 30 minutes just have the 30 minutes you can yeah. do that and they have the money and they have the time no one is no one has an expectation i know you like you said you wanted more but no one says well it has to be this uh, De- daredevil's netflix series has to be 13 episodes no it doesn't there's two episodes too many cut mm-hmm. them get rid you know and i think i think uh, that's what this series like you said has done um, mandalorian and this is kind of just going that's enough yeah that's all you need yeah, and I really like that because I was getting with Netflix. Like, I love the Daredevil series, like most people I presume do who've seen it. And it's just like every season's got two or three episodes too many. And I found mm-hmm. that with American Horror Story, which I'm not a huge fan of, but I always felt like they should have always finished about two episodes before they did. And it's that yeah, kind of thing yeah. where, and Netflix did it with a lot of stuff for a while. It was almost like everything they released had to be 13 episodes. Then they dropped it to 10. And now they think they're a bit more free with like eight ish. Mm-hmm. But it's just like, it's quite an American sort of idea where it's like, right, we've got a series, 24 episodes, 45 minutes each. And you're like, you want that? You want 18 hours of content for one season. Yeah. Whereas over here, it's yeah. like, let's have six or eight. Yeah. So I quite like that element. I, I like there being, it not being too much. Because a lot of people, when they're like, oh, I don't know, you know, watching Mandalorian, there's a lot there. And it's like, well, there's only like eight episodes a season and a, a lot of them are 30, 40 minutes. So it's yeah. not actually that long. It's just a few hours rather than it being like, you know, the DC stuff you know where it's like um <laughs> yeah, the exactly. arrowverse and things and it's just like what oh, <laughs> seven seasons of flash or whatever and it's just like 18 hours per season so you're like hundreds of hours just and they all cross over and oh. um, but we're not talking about that so i'm not gonna get sidetracked <laughs> raining back into boba fett so with the um obviously there are flashbacks and flash forwards and things so let's talk about what we what our favorite things were i suppose if, if there was a specific scene or a theme or even a little bit of dialogue that you've really quite enjoyed about it and what i quite liked about it i think myself 
the small thing was when you saw Boba Fett come out the side like pit and his arm was all you know damaged and stuff obviously t- the armor comes off and whatnot um, because the Jawas take it but I like that these the acid was left on his face and they left the burn marks and they did on his clothes yeah. and stuff as well and it was just they didn't make a big fuss and big song and dance watch him laying there with a skimmer's fizzing it was just he had the kind of goop on his face and both his armor and then time jump Tim obviously being passed out and the time had gone and then the burns got more intense and I like how you see him in the back to kind of recovering I quite like the way they did the flashbacks there but the acid part was probably my favourite small bit of that I'd say yeah. so um, Dan would you like to go first with your sort of favourite part there um, think of it. I, <laughs> I did enjoy spot. what is my favourite bit uh, 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 um, <laughs> you, know, you know what I really like in this episode is the Andy does a great impression actually of a Tuscan Raider can, can I ask you to perform, Andy? I can't no, I perform think. it on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I've That's always, good. I, I've always enjoyed Andy's Tuscan Raid. It's always brilliant. Well, you enjoy <laughs> it, but you can do it in public in front of yeah. hundreds <laughs> of unsuspecting <laughs> normal people. In the shopping centre or something. You do, you, do the ar- you do the arms and everything. It's brilliant. Um, but anyway, I love the humanisation of the Tuscan Raiders. There's a little mm. bit of it in Mandalorian. Yes. And there's yeah. obviously a lot here. Um, you know, with the child Tuscan Raider, or is that is the is Sam person a politically correct term? Can we say that, or do we I say th- Tuscan Raider? I mean, I think in I think it probably wouldn't necessarily be politically correct in the Star Wars universe, but much like many of the characters from the original trilogy, mm-hmm. they were called things as the action figures, and then mm-hmm. you know, like a sna- was it snaggle, uh, snaggle nose or something. Yeah, well, yeah. that's one of them. But it's, yeah. yeah, there's lo- lots of the the bar people from the cantina okay. all called random things. So yeah, sure, you can call sure. them sand people. I'm, or I'm going to say I'm going to say Tuscan Raiders because I, th- I think it's funny you say that though because when when they showed up and I'm thinking oh there's the sand people and then I'm thinking no there's another name for them and then I'm thinking no I'm sure Luke that that's what he calls them yeah, at it first does. it's yeah, like it sand is. people and then I'm thinking is that a racial slur on Tatooine <laughs> probably. <laughs> because they are Tuscan Raiders, aren't they? But he definitely yeah. calls them sand people initially. Exactly. So us yeah, out of universe, I wouldn't worry any, about it too Anyway, much. We'll, worry, we'll, <laughs> we'll worry about Star Wars racism later. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's not something we're going to solve today, Star no. Wars racism. Anyway, um, I love the humanisation of them because, again, in those original films, they're very much like, they're the enemy, they're the savages. <laughs> we can't, you know, we can't, you know, they do this and this is how they operate and they walk in single file to hide their numbers. They're evil, they're deceitful. You know, they'll kill you and eat you and what have you. And, they, you know, and I love that in the process of the Mandalorian and in this, they, you know, I love, I love that Mando speaks Tuscan as well. Yeah. Bit, and all that. Is and part brilliant. sign language, part vocal thing. I really, yeah, I love yeah, that. That was, that whole thing was amazing. I love that. And again, it's just like, yeah, they want to kill the great dragon. They want to do this. They want to kill this guy. They want to get Fennec, whatever. And I love that. And I love that they're just another race. They're just another people, bad or good, within the Star Wars universe. Um, you know, they, are, they do have a quite a menacing design, but, you know, I loved it. And again, with the child Tuscan Raider in this and the way that Boba spares him and and they have this kind of cute little relationship and it almost harkened back to Django and Boba mm. because, you know, he's like a kind of a warrior child as well. He's been bred to be a warrior and to, to kill and to hunt. So I love their connection. I love that he s- saves him from that centaur lizard or whatever it is called. I, I looked it up. Like, I, I looked creature. up and couldn't find what yeah. it was called. No, no like that my, creature is amazing. Get I love that. The Black Series action figure. Oh, at yeah. some point. Well, you know, well, the Rancor didn't go down too well in the Has Lab, did it? So no, we'll have to, we'll no, have to see not. with that. We'll have to see what happens with that. But um, I love, I love that little moment again. It and it. You know, there's obviously Boba Fett has been depicted as kind of a dirty Harry or a man with no name, Clint Eastwood type in the <laughs> past. But I like the kind of softening of his character that, that's mm. happened and that he's kind of learned from his mistakes. He's almost died. So he's had a near death experience. Yeah. So he so he is going to change his ideas or change mm. how he wants to do things, how he wants to operate, how who he chooses to be. And I think him meeting with the Mandalorian has changed how his outlook personally of his own life. And I think it just, it's all that kind of meshing of that universe and those stories and those characters together 
uh, which really works in this episode because we've been to this world. We've had two seasons of this world um, and, you know, several films and what have you and, you know, whatever Star Wars universe extra content. But that for me was my was my favourite moment, my takeaway, because I think mm-hmm. Tam- Tamora Morrison, I think is is his correct name, um, is is superb in everything I see him. I think he's great, be it Green Lantern, um, be it Aquaman, be it you know whatever he's in. I always think what a, what an absolute talent, and I'm glad he's a lead in this series. And also, I'm glad of the the back to tank healing that he mm. actually looks more like Tamora Morrison. He's not this pale, you know, craggy faced kind of stranger. Um, I loved that. So yeah, that whole Tuscan Raider stuff. So and I think that one that really kicked his ass. I think the weapon that one has. He has in Mandalorian. He does. Yeah, it look, it looks a bit similar, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's called. So a, there's going to be some kind of like Lawrence of Arabia kind of it's thing called, going on here, isn't there? It's called a Gaddafi stick, and the pointed yeah. thing at the end can be used oh. for bludgeoning people's heads, but also is used to clean the teeth of panthers. Right. Mm. Interesting. Mm. Uh, in- yeah, interesting. Yeah, interesting name down, as well. What? As in- uh, yeah, maybe. I think there's going to be a bond, or because I think maybe they even teach him some of the martial arts. It looks like because when he turns up in the Mandalorian, which I get again is a great reintroduction to the character, hmm. he does have a bit of a kind of a unique martial arts style that he doesn't have here. Yeah. I think. Um, so yeah. So anything, all the stuff with Boba and the Tuscan Raiders for me was great. Cool. And Dave, what about yourself? My mind's just wondering now. I wonder if, like, the Tuscan Raiders, we're going to have a whole, like, martial arts montage or something where he's training Boba Fett because <laughs> one of the things that struck me was that the action just wasn't as good. Mm-hmm. But actually, I guess that was modern day. So this is the modern day stuff was post-Mandalorian, wasn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, there goes that thought. I don't know if I had a favorite moment, but I alluded to it before. It's just so good to be back in the world and the attention to detail and i know not everyone hates the sequels but i I think it's just obvious that you know the with the mandalorian it's written by people and and the whole crew and everything are just obsessed with star wars and so it's just there's so many little nods and and i'll watch this episode probably a couple more times before next uh next week because I noticed, I I watched it the first time, so Wednesday morning comes out, watching it straight away. And then I watched it again in prep for this, and I noticed so many other little things that I hadn't noticed before. So things like when you get the uh, Space Ninjas or whatever these guys, (laughs) you know, they turn up, and they've got the little um, shields, which have got this red kind of energy signature. And I'm thinking... That's just like Phantom Menace when, uh, you know, when Obi-Wan oh, is squaring off against uh, Darth Maul. Mm-hmm. Mm. And it's it's like the same thing and, uh, you know, the same energy signature, the the uh, the sticks that they were using as well. We've seen those a few times, oh, yeah. you know, seeing some of the characters that, that we'd seen before. You, you had um, when everyone was paying their tribute, you had the robot who was torturing that little droid, you know, when uh, in Return of the Jedi. And it always freaked me out that bit. He's turning him upside down to like uh, burn his feet kind of thing. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. So iconic, isn't it? It's yeah. exactly that great impression. Exactly that sound. So I just loved the whole episode for just being immersed in that world mm. and clearly being made by people who love the universe. Yeah, I agree. That's great. And what about you, Andy, then? Favourite sort of parts or moments or themes within the episode? Yeah, well, like like I said, uh, sort of spoiling before, wasn't it, when I said the throne room scene with the tributes and everything, I think it was all of those early moments. So like 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 Dave just said there, with like the attention to details, the, the opening sort of segment was we get like this fly-through of Jabba's empty palace, you know, mm. and the dimensions are exact, absolutely exact. And we get that long shot from the from the big the big door, obviously, that opens up and Luke wanders through in Return of the Jedi. And we get that exact same shot. Everything looks, you know, exact. It's incredible, really. They've got the proportions down spectacularly. And then they change the dynamic with the way that um the way the, the character approaches how he wants to do things. That's that was why it's my favorite scene because it's like, yes, this is it's complete shift in what we know. 
and it, it's it's really obvious what he wants to do and how he wants to approach it. And you get those moments of levity. And just going back to what Dan said before about Fennec and and Boba sort of possibly splitting off, mm. I reckon Fennec could more than likely be sort of like the bridge between the audience and Boba. If there's part, if there's moments when he doesn't quite know how to express himself, I think it'll be Fennec that's in there and going right because she does it throughout the episode. And that, she's really good in this first episode, I think, because she gives that sort of like, you know, they used to do it this way and he goes, no, I'm going to do it my way. And she's like, all right, then maybe you should listen to me. And then you get that funny little bit later on. Well, well, I told you I'm going to do it this way and it's worked out, hasn't it? So there you go. Mm. So yeah, that, that, that throne, the throne room scene for me was just beautiful. You get mm. the, that uh, oh, Trandosian comes yep. in. Mm. Brilliant. And immediately, as soon as I saw it, I went, Bosk will appear at some point. Yeah. Oh yes, please. Absolutely. He was one of the not, not, not going to not have. I'm not going to not put the effort into having a, a fully first time we've seen properly, other than like Bosk, obviously in in the in the Star Destroyer, but fully like animated. Some you know actor, you know mm. moving, yeah. talking. First time we've seen live action, live speaking Trandosian. I was just like, Bosk has got to come in. Yeah, got yeah. to come in. But then the same in the same breath, I was like. Let's hope they do it properly. Let's mm-hmm. hope these these cameos or characters come in and they feel organic. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You, you, it's one of those things that some of the some of the individuals I've spoken to about this show, a couple that will be on uh, next week's episode and things as well. I think the worry uh, somewhat is. With the Mandalorian, obviously we had Ahsoka, which is a big fan favorite, you know, and then also you had Luke, which is just a big favorite in general, you know, mainstream audiences love Luke. Um, Obviously everyone kind of does, um, but Ahsoka was more under the radar stuff. And so I think Mm. with Book of Boba Fett, some people's concerns are, are they just going to keep relying on cameos? Now, I I hope they don't. I don't, you know, I, I do love seeing when, you know, things cross over, you know, I don't want... For example, like Din Jar in The Mandalorian. I don't necessarily want mm. him popping up loads, but if he's going to pop no. up, I want it to be yeah. once at the end for a reason that's substantial. It's like, it's like yeah. plot is the number one priority. Second to that is then, uh, you know, aesthetic and uh, other sort of dialogue and other things like that. But, sure. but cameos are quite low on the list. Although I like seeing them make me happy, they have yeah, to yeah. kind of work. And we don't yeah. want it just to be a, hey, right, Disney's releasing the new thing. Well, it's called Kenobi, but it's actually Kenobi, but Boba Fett pops up in it when he's young. Yeah. And then also you've got Ahsoka is in flashbacks in this part. And then and it becomes this, yeah. they're all just kind of only really 20 to 30% of what the show's advertised to be. And the rest of it is just this ongoing yeah. story. Um, so, and I think they're going to have to get the balance of that right. I would say by this episode, it does feel like they're getting things on their own two feet. I think one of the things yeah, I quite yeah, liked yeah. about it was, yeah, the diving into the star like i was a bit worried they were going to be like hey here's like every episode at the start you're going to get two minutes of him stuck in the star pit and it's going to just progress <laughs> it you know and then the last episode you get five minutes of action yeah but you know there's, there's shows that do things like that where they've got um final space is one of them which i do really enjoy where it's just got a snippet of something at the start of the end and then you have to get to the end of that to see what happens and i was like you know, most big Star Wars fans kind of already know Boba Fett survived. People who don't already yeah. know that are going to want to know ASAP. They're not going to want to have to wait because then it would just get spoiled yeah. on the internet anyway. So quite like that. Um, that's all element of it. But um, I would, speaking of negative things slightly, um, was although I did enjoy the episode, I thought it was great. I would be in agreement with Dave, uh, which was regarding the action. Now, that was the only part of this episode that I think um, didn't quite hold up to what I would have expected from an episode like this especially because it was directed by robert rodriguez and obviously we saw what he could do in the boba fett episode of mandalorian in series two which yeah. is phenomenal and me and megan recently we watched series two of mando and that it's still so well done and i just this one didn't feel like it was actually to me even directed by the same person if you put those two things next to each other yeah i, I wouldn't have necessarily been able to tell and i am quite a fan of robert rodriguez so i'm hoping and i think it's what dave i spoke to you about slightly earlier when we were uh, messaging what I'm kind of hoping is the only reason it's like this is because they're they're not trying to lean too much on the action in a sense because Robert Rodriguez has got a lot of big ideas and loads of crazy stuff like if anyone's seen things like Planet Terror from Dust Till Dawn yeah. loads of mental cool stuff in that but he doesn't blow his load at the start he is yeah, very yeah. much middle end so I'm hoping this was just a little taste of the action almost like a a token fight just to be like here's the first episode they have to fight these people in the alleyway because we need some sort of action to prove this is going to have action in it and then maybe later on we're going to get some sort of big crazy set piece big episode which is kind of what i'm sort of um 
hoping for. But I don't know if any of you guys had any thoughts on uh, either what I just said or any negative elements of it. Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree with the fighting. It felt really, really clunky. Hmm. It was it's quite funny, really, because they they all the, all those those, nin, those space ninjas, as <laughs> Dave so eloquently put, like all came tumbling, and I went, "Oh fucking hell, shit!" They're, they're getting ambushed here. This is how it starts. It's like the, the war of the bounty hunters thing. And hmm. they put those shields up. As soon as they put those shields up, it's like they they suddenly went, "Oh, we've run out of ideas of how we should progress this fight." And it literally like one shield came forward block with your left arm that's it right okay another shield come forward right fennec you block with your right arm excellent now we'll reverse boba you block with your right arm then fennec your left arm and it, it, they did that about three or four times i was like well you don't know what to do here do you oh we'll try a flip that's a good trick and it didn't work and then somehow the the, uh, the gamorian guards who'd vanished just briefly yeah. beforehand mm. rather conveniently suddenly charged in and saved them did he, didn't he have his jetpack on? Uh, yeah. I think he did. I did wonder why he didn't use yeah, it. I, I thought he was going like, to when he was in the middle. Really like, I thought he was going to fly in the air and shoot or yeah. something, but he didn't. They're literally the, That's they're a crushing, really good him, point. crushing him, crushing him, crushing him, crushing him. I would just shoot up and then beep, 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 or shoot. Well, he's got his flames, hasn't he? Flames just throw, cook, yeah. all, cook all over their feet. <laughs> any, any, any of the wonderful <laughs> tools like the, the, you know, the... Uh, the leg, the thing that he wraps Luke up in return. Yeah, just yeah, the grapple hook thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, those knee rockets. The knee rockets yeah. he never uses. Use them. Yeah, because you any, saw any of the <laughs> when he was like suiting up. You even saw them. So it was like, oh, yeah. didn't use them necessarily. Check really off, weird check off's knee rockets. Yeah. <laughs> when they left that bar thing, the gun warrior and guards came out walking with them, and then the next shot they'd vanished completely, and it was kind of like, oh, I think you forgot that you had them with you. <laughs> during this fight and they went oh shit we need to put them in I'll just have them charge in where were they what were they doing they I, I will side. I will def- I think that fight scene is yeah I agree I agree I don't think it's well choreographed it doesn't make much sense um, I think the rooftop bit is a bit better with Fennec mm. when she yep. goes chases after him but yeah. if we're looking at action sequences in this I think again I love me the Tusken Raiders so where he gets his ass kicked by the Tusken Raider and then the fight with the beast the lizard yeah. centaur, as mm-hmm. I'm going to call him. Like, that is great. Like, that's fun. It's good. The creature looks amazing. There's threat. There's intensity. You've got that annoying little Rodian, who's a little horrible little wretch he is, um, you know, digging up the water and stuff. Hilarious. And he's, <laughs> he's voiced by Sam Witwer as well, who voices Maul in the animated series and plays Starkiller oh, in The Force Amazing. Movies. But I think, yeah. I think that, that, for me, was the action set piece, because it, mm. it was visually interesting. There was stakes. Yeah. There was worry. He didn't have all his gadgets. You know, he's not Batman in the, at this point. He hasn't got all his stuff. <laughs> You know, because he is, he's basically Batman. He's his bad, cool, you know, with all the gadgets and grapple. He's got a grappling, for God's sake. Uh, <laughs> he's basically Star Wars' Batman. Um, but I, I, I really like that. And again, you get to see Tamora uh, do his best acting with all the, even through all that kind of scar, makeup and dry skin stuff, like it all comes through. And and even the even the little kid who's playing the Tuscan Raider, like mm. I, I, you know, I could feel the reaction, I could feel the relief, and then and then that moment where they come back and they're successful, and they're like, yeah, good job, have some water, that sort of thing. So so for me, that yeah. was that kind of made up for the clunkier action scene for me earlier on. And Dave, do you have anything to mention about the action scenes? Because obviously we spoke prior to recording. I was just trying to. Google around, but I think I've failed <clears throat> just to see. Obviously, so Rodriguez is the obvious comparison because he's the director. Mm. But I was trying to see who the stunt coordinators were for the different mm. episodes, and I think that might be the the variable. Nah. It it, yeah. it definitely just wasn't as good. Um, and and it, it like even with the camera shots and everything, it's not just like the the fighting if you like it's the yeah, it's the way it's it. shot and and just i don't know there's, there's something just off but it, it was an unbelievably high bar wasn't it i mean that episode eight of mandalorian season two yeah. when he just it's absolutely amazing. kicks ass and i remember at the time everyone's like basically this has been 40 years in the making because everyone's thought you know since empire strikes back and I remember having the little Boba Fett figures and didn't really know much about him, but God damn it, he looked cool. And it's, but he never really did much, you know, and especially in yeah. Return of the Jedi, he was done a bit of a disservice, wasn't he? Just <laughs> accidentally killed by Han Solo, who's half blind still. Um, whereas that episode was just like, holy shit, this is what we've been waiting for. Um, and this was just a, a bit of a step down from that. And so, yeah. I, 
yeah, hopefully that's just a one-off. Um, yeah, but I think I think the main the main issue is with all series, nobody goes back and goes number one was the best episode of that series. No, because, exactly because it's yeah, all. Yeah. It's all set up. There's all a lot of mysteries, a lot of characters yeah. that are uh, talked about. You've got uh, uh, Jennifer Beals' character. Jennifer Beals of Flashdance uh, is is in this as a, a Twi'lek, uh, and she runs kind of a brothel, I think it's implied. It sort of looks like a brothel, yeah. doesn't her, it? A, a space brothel. Her, her name is <laughs> Madame Garza Fwip. Ah, okay. like, I did a bit of research before this. I didn't know that from, from the episode. Or, 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 <laughs> or it might be just an exotic dance place because that would go in line with flash dance, wouldn't it? So, yeah. um, but she's clearly, I think, quite a duplicitous character, and I think she will show herself to be not so great later down the series. I think that I have a theory about the mayor of of mm. Mos Esper as mm. well. So, so. So Mos Esper was, was the desert town that was being protected by Timothy Oliphant's character. Cobb Vanth. Yes, that's the one. I'm glad you know, Mike, because I certainly don't. <laughs> um, and, and he obviously made the deal with the Mandalorian to kill the crate Dragon and to save them all while wearing Boba Fett's armor and gifting it back to him after they were successful. So my, my theory is that the mayor is not taking any money or giving any gifts to the crime lord because that is Timothy Oliphant's character. And he wants to, he's the marshal, was the marshal, now he's the mayor, and he wants to run it legitimately. Uh, and I think because of the link to both Fett and the armor, I think it would be really nice for those characters to meet up and interact. I think that would be really cool to see. Uh, mm. But I could be wrong. I don't know if there's there's more continuity stuff. I don't know if there is already a mayor of Esper in the in the canon, maybe. Or I don't I know because yeah. the place that Cobb Vanth was was Mos Pelgo, which is oh across, sorry, Mos Pelgo, yeah, yeah, sorry, which is across the sea. So it could. It, obviously, there is clearly a power vacuum of some sort. I mean, yeah. I I would love to see Cobb Vanth pop up again. It's too many um, mosses for a start. Well, there's three, isn't mosses. there? I, Isley, so Pelgo, and Esper mosses. that we know of. Uh, yeah, I think Moss is probably hut for city or town mm. or something or settlement, whatever. But yeah, yeah I mean, it. well, we're kind of getting towards the end here. So what we say, um, what do we... Obviously, that was one of your theories, Dan, and stuff, which you know, I would love, even if he's not necessarily a crime lord or anything like that, I would love to see Cobb Vanth mm. come back into it. Um, I think he was probably the cameo I'd look forward to the most because it would make the most sense. Yeah. And he's such a small character. There's no expectation. No fanboys are going to get aggravated by it. Mm. Um, so I think that's really sound. So um, Andy and Dave, do you want to say, do you guys have any sort of either theories or thoughts onto the um, what's coming up? Obviously, it was already mentioned, the sort of soprano element of things, but I didn't know if you had any predictions, if you wanted to to voice them or anything like that. Uh, it's 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 difficult, I think, because this episode, like I said, it didn't really give you much in the way of what could go forward. No. Obviously, like Dan mentioned, the um the owner of the, the nice lovely brothel, obviously she's gonna play probably a very key part going forward. Mm. Whether she leads some kind of like resistance to his rule and wants to rule herself, you know, it could be it could be anything really, I think, going forward. I think that's what the good thing is about this first episode. It, it sort of sets its stall, gives you what you wanted in terms of how the hell did he get out of the salad pit and what happened to him initially to get him into the point we see him in, in, in The Mandalorian. And then gives you a little taste of his plan, but then still leaves it sort of like on that, on that little bit of an edge. Who is this gang who's trying to kill him already? He's literally only just walked out. Yeah, okay, he killed Bib Fortuna. Maybe somebody's really pissed off about that. But, you know... There's clearly, like you said, that power vacuum. People want this. People mm. want that throne. You know, whatever it means on the outside, it doesn't matter. In in this town, that throne is everything. People mm. want it. So rather than it being an expectation, I think for me it's it's more of a case of I want to see where this sort of conflict of interest goes. You know, is Fennec gonna get pissed off about Boba's, you know, light-hearted sort of like, oh, we'll do this respectfully, we'll do this properly. Is it going to get to a point where Boba goes, okay, I'm really going to have to do somebody in here <laughs> so they get the idea that respect, you know, respect is, you know, can be earned or it can be taken if you won't do as I tell you. Mm. So I think I'm interested rather than expecting, I think, to see where it goes in that regard. And with any sort of cameos, like I said, if the other cameo is going to come in like another bounty hunter gets called to take him out. Maybe it is somebody that we already know, Fallon, Zucas, 
you know, any of those, as long as they're done properly and they're done organically within within the episodes, within the story, then they'll hit. And it'd be it'd be great just to see. We'd have to see all of them, like we saw in, in Empire, but a couple of them, you know, coming in to say, "Well, I've been hired to take you down, big fet," because you you bite off more than you can chew. And then maybe he twists them and adds them to his menagerie of people that are going to, you know, control the system. Mm. Very intriguing. Yeah. Mm. I, like I said, I, I don't really have any major expectations. I think I'm just going to roll with it and see what comes now, I think. But as long as it keeps that underground gangster sort of taste, then I think I'll be happy. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. What about you, Dave? I suspect strongly the whole season is going to be playing off this this uh, idea of fear versus respect to rule mm, people yeah. in the very first you know a new hope it, it was grand moff's grand moff tarkin's line wasn't it that fear will keep local systems in line and so you get that whole concept throughout the star wars universe about fear ruling people mm-hmm. and then when that fear isn't there and you know all these people and different local tribes and gangs and whatever have been subservient to that fear before when it's not there, then you do get that power grab. And so I think, I think Boba Fett's going to find it very difficult. He's going to find all these people coming from different angles, um, trying to take the throne and, and trying to become the Wilson Fisk of the, of Tatooine. So no, it's just, but beyond that, I don't really have any more expectations. I think I've seen enough in this first episode to know, again, they're going to continue to knock it out of the park in terms of honoring and respecting what's come before it. There's a few throwaway lines. Andy mentioned about Bosk there, and there was the little line, wasn't it, that I used to work for a Trandoshan. Yeah. And then he's having trouble with the local language. He's like, oh, I could do with the protocol droid. And you're like, oh, <laughs> we know a protocol droid. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm just, although it, probably to be honest, I, I enjoyed it more on the second time of watching because I was looking at more of what was going on and, and the little things that, that the little characters in the background and whatever. Um, not too sure about the song choices. You know, we had a little sort of Spanish little number, didn't we? And I, I kind of like is, the old... It is Robert du, 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 Rodriguez. Du, du, du. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah. Oh, I wonder if we'll have uh, El Mariachi. I wonder if we'll... <laughs> that would be we'll so have something. cool. Oh, oh, if they play Tito and the Tarantula, I love it. It's a great Oh. Band. Doom, oh, doom, doom, doom. <laughs> just going on that it's like the the, the japanese western influences are coming in full Ooh, force yeah. aren't they Absolutely. yeah like they, they called him daimyo which is like you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 that, well we we did yakuza months didn't we andy and that's like yeah. the head head yakuza crime yeah. boss leader is is what you call the daimyo um i i think i lied to you though mike I, about my favorite moment in the, sh- the whole show <laughs> well you said it now no that's the end We're, no no bye, guys go it's it really great <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, Dad. Sorry. go ahead dad <laughs> my my favorite speaking of droids my favorite moment was realizing that the droid in jabba's throne room was matt berry and hearing mm. him pronounce all the weird Star Wars names like Bib Fortuna. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that that just that was that was it for me. I just was like, I was just I didn't even hear what he said. I was just pissing yeah. myself because it's just him. I love him from Garth Marenghi, Toast of London, you know, what we do in the shadows. I, I, can't, I can never Bush. get brass on so much um, of it. <laughs> IT club, you know, IT I, crowds. I do like that. I do like that how they're getting these weird and wonderful British actors to voice the droids. <laughs> yeah, because like, yeah, obviously they've Richard got like Richard Iwadi. voiced um, that one in uh, first season of Mandalorian. Zero, yeah, Zero yeah, I yeah. think his name was. His name. And uh, Taika yeah. Waititi, obviously he's not uh, English, but he's um, from New Zealand and he voiced yeah. IG-11, yeah. Uh, which is quite mm. fun. So mm-hmm. it's just people, like Star Wars has now got so much content. Everyone's like, oh, I like Star Wars. Can I just be a little part in here? Because like, if I was a famous yeah. person or just if anyone's listening, I would do this anyway for free. Just be like, <laughs> hey, do you want to come down, Mike, and be on set of the Star Wars for a day and be a rebel pilot that gets blown up or be a protocol droid? I'd be like, I will do anything you want me to do. <laughs> I think just the biggest one was like Daniel Craig, wasn't it? He's just he was unnamed Stormtrooper. Stormtrooper. He was, he was the one yeah. that Ray uses yeah, the yeah. mind trick on J- in Jason, the yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah, Jason yeah. Sudeikis was the one who punched Grogu on the speeder bike, wasn't he? 
Oh, I didn't realise that. Oh, I mean, really? That's Jason. <laughs> nice. That's Jason Sudeikis punches him uh, twice, and I love it. We've got, oh, we've got to make sure Ted Lasso. Alive. Yeah, yeah. Ted Lasso punching <laughs> Grogu. That's an asshole. Take that image when you go to bed tonight. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, speaking of all this organised crime and speaking of Daredevil, it was good that we had the hand in the episode as well. The ninja, yes. the dead ninja death cult. Um, <laughs> yeah. And they they branched out into the Star Wars world, so Disney owns that, so it's fine. They own all those. So God, I bet if Iron Fist, the guy who played him came in and was like the main baddie I think and the same choreographer it'd be like that would kill this series for me quite quickly yeah. I have well, was well he did. He never listens to the choreographers no. never does the practice or the exactly. work so he probably probably would actually get his ass kicked <laughs> probably a good thing well so with with, with with Book of Boba Fett like I thought um, I thought it was a really solid at first episode, I thought it it probably could have been a, maybe a bit better in certain ways, but it definitely didn't let me down. It definitely there weren't any glaring big issues. It wasn't like you know akin to Star Wars: Phantom Menace, where you go, "Oh Jesus Christ!" And there weren't any big glaring plot details like in the Rise of Skywalker that were like after a bit of thought. You're like, "Wait a minute, that doesn't make sense." And that doesn't. But mm. it's episode one, so there's only so much. Uh, resources you can almost dig or you can mine from this episode. You know, we've now yeah. been chatting longer than the episode actually is. Um, so. I that, honestly think, sorry to cut across no, you, please Mike, do. I honestly think we could keep going for the same time again, though. There were, there were just we so many nuggets in here. And one yeah. of the things you and I have talked about is, you know, the, the fact that you've got these different factions, you've got the original trilogy crowd, and then you've got people like yourself who, who grew up with the prequels. So that's their trilogy kind of thing. And they managed to get all of these references in you know straight off the bat you're like wow this is right after return of yeah. the jedi when he gets out of the sarlacc pit you can see jabba's palace or, or his little speeder thing all in ruins there you get the flashback to attack of the clones where um uh, Boba's picking up jango's head you know after uh mace windows chopped it off and stuff yeah. they just got so many of these things in they've got the the tuscan raiders riding in single file to hide their numbers uh, and um I, I think dan mentioned about the westerns as well you know, so many western kind of uh nods as well and uh, even to the point where um bob is getting dragged behind the tuscan raiders yeah, yeah. it just flashes you back to the good the bad and the ugly where clint eastwood's yeah. getting uh dragged along it's just so so good and i um, i know some people were disappointed about it but i am chomping at the bit for this series and i think going yeah. back to the going back to the western thing um that's where I think the the Tuscan Raiders initially came in. It was like they're the Native Americans, they're the enemy. We don't like them. They're gonna, you know, or anything like that. But that's why I like the humanization of them mm. um, because it takes yeah, away that true. kind of racist element. And, mm -hmm. and again, in Mando, in the second series, as a Mando with the crate dragon, them working together to destroy a, a bigger enemy. You know, it's it's great, and I love that. Again, it has the touches of the westerns, but it doesn't take like the the negative aspects of the those westerns you know or like that kind of you know white conqueror kind of white mm. hero sort of uh yeah. hero thing going on i like that and you know it's it's great it's, it's just balanced and it, it, it balanced feels organic yeah mm. it, it feels organic platform. the way the way it's being done like all those little all those little bits of references like the way the tuscan readers are behaving the change that you see in them accepting an outsider mm. it felt really organic the one hope that i have is that they maintain that sort of allure of mystery and we don't see anyone take the mask off or anything. Mm. I, I don't think it's going to end well. That's, that's kind of a, a weird sort of prediction. I've just thought in my head. I don't think it's going to end well for them. I think there'll be some, either something happen or, you know, maybe it will end well. Maybe they will let him go and give him all these gifts, um, you know, to help think, him on his way to find his armor. But mm. there's a little something that I think I, do you, oh, you think they're, you think they're being a bit, a bit too nice to him too early, do you think? Yeah, I'm just thinking like sort of like classic Westerns, you know, they help the stranger and then they suffer as a result, you know, through, you know, something mm. that they didn't necessarily do themselves. Mm. And then he goes on sort of like a, a mad spree of vengeance. But they, they, uh, it is Disney kind of though, isn't it? I hope they don't do it. I hope they don't do it. I hope they just let him sort of go on his own way with these I, gifts of the gaffy stick. Because it's Disney, though, and you've got the kid there. I, I don't think they'll have the tribe yeah. slaughtered. Unless he yeah. accidentally does something that causes the death of the child, and then that makes them turn on him. But then that might be a bit too... But then you say it's Disney. I know prequels were 
um, not under the realm of Disney. Mm. But, you know, Attack of the Clone, uh, uh, Revenge of the Sith, that's still in there. And so mm. it's like, it, it could be. Um, I'm uh, With the Tusken Raider and sort of thing, I... I I think he's just going to stay them for a long time because I think he's just going to almost be trapped in the middle of the desert with them. No idea yeah. how to get back with no way to really... Because obviously he, it's about five years after Return of the Jedi to present day. Mm. And even if you argue the events of Mandalorian took six months, even at a push a year or so, there's yeah. still four years where he got out of the Sarlacc pit and then well, in theory, even if he was in there for a, a few weeks or something, but like... Yeah. He, there's not a huge amount of time that's passed since him falling in the Sarlacc pit and getting out, but there has been quite a bit of time from where we've last seen him and where we saw him in Mandalorian. There's a few years there at least. Mm. So it is that thing of, is he just going to stay with them because that's all he can do for now? Is he going to try and escape and they're going to mm. not let him? Like, what mm. What is the dynamic of their relationship going to be? And I do agree with you guys where it's like the perspective of it is like, yeah. Tuscan Raiders, yeah, if you go on their land, then they'll attack you. That's, yeah. that's kind of what they do in a sense, but... Mm. There is more to them than that. And I think that that's what the new era of Star Wars is trying to show a bit more. And yeah. I think that's what Last Jedi alluded to somewhat with the character of DJ by, you know, Benicio del Toro. It's like, mm. yeah, there is, there is good and bad to a degree, but not everyone is absolute good and everyone is absolute bad. It's not, sure. and there's Palpatine's involved. Yeah. It's not generally yeah. that simple. <laughs> it's very dances with wolves going back to another Western yeah. reference. Mm. Very, it's a very dances so. with wolves sort of vibe about his connection with them and, you know, them accepting him and, you know, Giving them water, yeah. <laughs> plain and simple. D- very much they, like yeah, they did have a different. They did have a different outfit, though, didn't they? Yeah, Even they did, yeah. I, I went back and looked at, mm. at the uh, the Mandalorian, and there was still more the classic Star Wars, and these mm. looked a bit different. Mm. And and I wondered if that meant they were a different tribe. The uh, the tents looked a little bit different as well, so I I, I don't know if that's going to mean anything or it's just a natural kind of evolution. Mm. I, I think I have to think it means something because nothing yeah. in yeah. this universe, uh, you know, seems to happen by accident. So it'll be interesting where that goes. But did you guys think that? Um, I mean, the little kid took credit for killing that monster, didn't he? Yeah. And the chief's like, look, I know. <laughs> and that's why he gave him the, the water. So I think there's going to be a, a bond developed between the, the chief and, yeah. and Boba Fett. Dave, 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 don't forget, like, Star Wars killed off very tragically Ewoks in Return mm. of the Jedi. Oh, that moment where there's the and dead that one. Was, that oh. was heartbreaking. That could have been. A oh child. yeah. That could have been a child. We don't know. Mm. It's a fuzzy, furry little bear. So mm. Tusken Raiders were originally not known as being so nice or friendly. Yeah, so. I can see it in my mind's eye yeah. now. There's, there's a moment he tries to wake his mate up, yeah. and oh, you get the sad music, <laughs> and it, get, it gets me right there every time. Every time. Every time. <laughs> Same for me. 100. percent Well, guys, I mean, chat about this has been absolutely fantastic with you all. So um, we'll wrap up here, and I'll just say each of you, and you can see your social media stuff. If there's any final words uh, that you want to say on Boba Fett or on this first episode that you didn't get to, this is your chance. Um, so we'll wrap up first. Um, um, Andy, would you like to say your plugs and any final thoughts? Yeah, so my main source of output is, like I said, on YouTube, um, Angry Andy Reviews. I am on Twitter as well, at Andy underscore review. Um, that's where a lot of my sort of correspondence go through. So, yeah, you can catch me on there. Um, final thoughts? Pretty good. Pretty good. I like that we're, we're, he's, he's already being tested and um, I'm pretty excited to see where it goes within this gangster world because I bloody love gangster movies. I love gangster shows just as much as I love Star Wars. So I am pretty excited about it going forward. Absolutely wonderful. Cool. And then Spider Dan, what about yourself? Um, Spider Dank Farrick. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, Spider Dan. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, is the one I use most. So that's Dan at Dan underscore balls, uh, spider Dan secret balls on Instagram. And it's just at secret balls on Facebook podcast is on all good podcatchers, spider Dan and the secret balls. You'll find it. Uh, Mike's going to leave all those lovely links in all of his show notes I for am. you for everybody, all of these lovely people on here as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think it was a really, really good start. Really interesting. Got, there's a lot of in 
intrigue, good setup. So I'm I'm actually really looking forward to it. I loved Mandalorian in these last two days. Uh, <laughs> I'm so surprised you. Be, I didn't realize when I asked you to come on that you hadn't watched. All, like I know when you <laughs> said to me, oh, I've decided to binge them all, and I was like, oh cool, he's rewatching them, and they're like, no, oh no, I haven't seen no, before. The like, first <laughs> time, uh, wow. while while also doing uh, full shifts of work and stuff. But I've, I managed privileged. it. Don't Thank you, worry. sir. Don't worry, <laughs> I, I work hard for for good people. <laughs> True pro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah really good really good start really interested to see where it all goes so yeah great stuff wonderful and then last of all dave tell people where they can find you what you're up to and your final thoughts so you can get me at seattle dojos on twitter or in terms of podcasts you can get me on comics in motion on a friday doing tv and movie reviews you can get me on the vhs strikes back as well we've just finished um recapping the uk office first two seasons on back to the office podcast as well um so everywhere basically just spawning these little uh franchise podcasts everywhere <laughs> uh in terms of i, I mean I, I i don't have a very good poker face do I? I i i at first when i watched this episode i didn't love it i i just really enjoyed it but on second watch I started to love it again. It was just so great being back in that world and you notice so many of the little details and, and that's why I'm going to watch it probably a couple more times because I'm sure there is just so much on there. You know, I, I've missed loads as well. And and even though I, I forget, you know, the names of the aliens and stuff almost as soon as I've read them, but I recognize them, you know, and it just feels so, so comfortable. And I just... I, I feel confident that in the hands of Favreau and, and Filoni, that, that they know that with the end of season two of Mandalorian, they set the bar in such a high way. I mean, I love the MCU, but what they managed to do was turn a, a, what had become a little bit of a toxic fan base who at the uh, for Rise of Skywalker was completely the other end of the pendulum it was like you have screwed up this franchise completely disney's bought a dud you'll never be able to do anything and then they somehow managed to completely swing the pendulum the other way and give us what we didn't even know we were wanting for mm. 40 years but we got it and it was like holy shit and then it's great that you've been able to binge but i tell you what there is nothing in fandom that I experienced like when I saw that cameo at the end of Mandalorian 2. It was just, ah, oh, it's got me there again right now, just thinking about it. So I, I just think these guys deserve our trust. And so, you know, I'm just going to sit back. I'm going to continue to try not to have any real expectations. I'm not going to be predicting that Mephesto is going to pop up or anything. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm just, <laughs> I'm just along for the ride and I can't wait. Absolutely amazing. Well, you guys can find me uh, on this feed of Comics in Motion uh, on Saturdays. I release episodes of my show Star Wars Comics in Canon. And if you haven't checked it out, shame on you listening on this very feed and listening to me talk about Boba Fett and not listening to my show. Um, yeah, if you've never read a Star Wars comic in your life, or if you've read every single one, which I'd be impressed if you had, check out my show because whether whether or not you've read a comic or not, it works perfectly. I talk about the plot details and the many connections to other content. And uh, yeah, got a lot of exciting stuff in the new year. On social media, you can can find me at genuine chit chat on instagram twitter and on facebook and that is the name of my air quotes main show uh, where i have honest conversations with interesting people and i've spoken to uh paolo villanelli the comic book artist of bounty hunters i spoke to claudia gray who's an author uh for star wars i spoke to quite a few cool people and i got more cool ones in the way and i'm hoping to have andy and also dan at some point in 2022 on the show days well enough he doesn't need to come on again me and him do enough collaborations without him coming back on genuine chit chat <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah it's um really really cool having you guys on and um yeah i'm i'm the host organizer of this little event for the next seven weeks so we'll definitely have you guys on um not dave we'll have you andy and uh <laughs> andy and dan on again um, i won't be able to get dave off this show i know that he's gonna yeah. get up again um but we'll definitely have to sort something like this again so thank you yeah. so much for coming on guys obviously links to it all the details are in the show notes and this is where i will stop recording so uh thanks listeners bye now